The Meadows Company is the developer of the world's largest estimated undeveloped resource for battery metals for electric vehicles and the world's number one and number two largest undeveloped nickel projects. So with me is Craig Shesky, the Chief Financial Officer of the Metals Company, and our resulting CEO of Quantum Media will be joining me today. So let's start, Craig, with um, the clarion Clipperton zone of the Pacific Ocean. Explain what the company is doing there. You got it, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, what we're developing is a resource here of polymetallic nodules. And these are rocks that contain nickel, copper, cobalt, and manganese and they lay on top of the seafloor in the clarion Clipperton zone of the Pacific Ocean. So this specific patch has high abundance of these nodules, and these nodules have very high grades of the metals that we need for the clean energy transition. So we're developing the technology to collect and process these nodules into battery metals, and we expect to be in production at the end of 2025. And why is TMC, Craig, going after a seafloor resource? Well, that's where a lot of the metal is. It makes sense to go to the area of the planet where there's the least life uh, to um, get the metals needed for the clean transition. And that's what this area represents. So there's actually more nickel, cobalt, and manganese in the clarion Clipperton zone than all known land-based reserves combined. So this is actually a really good place to locate these metals. If you had to pick anywhere that has the least life, this is the area of the planet that represents um, you know, what is the best hope for the clean energy transition and weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels. Mm. Explain the process. Like, how do you find these? How do you collect them? What's the technology behind it? Yeah, actually, the technology has been around uh, really since the 1970s. So people have known about this resource for a long time. And in fact, it's quite easy to know what's down there because you can actually survey it. It's a two-dimensional resource sitting on top of the seafloor. So you can take pictures of it in addition to sampling it. So the technology to actually collect these nodules has been around for a while. Uh, really, it's more like collecting golf balls on a driving range than it is deep sea mining. Mm -hmm. There's no digging, there's no blasting, there's no drilling. So they're easy to see. They have naturally very high grades of nickel, copper, cobalt, and manganese. They're actually quite easy to collect as well. Mm -hmm. um, one of the great things about the resource is you can actually use existing technology both to collect these nodules and process them at existing facilities. So typically on land, you may have to go further into a jungle or a desert when you're looking for nickel or cobalt or copper, and then you have to bring the infrastructure with you. Here, we can actually collect the nodules and ship them anywhere where that infrastructure already exists, and that allows us to ramp up in a capital light way. Now, uh, deep sea mining, controversial. A lot of people don't want to see any more of it. How do you address people who have some resistance to these ex extractive industries? Sure. Well, look, I think... The starting place is that we're going to need a lot more of these metals for the clean transition. The International Energy Agency estimates you'll need four to six times more of some of these base metals by 2040 if we're going to hit our uh, Paris Agreement climate goals by 2050. So the metals have to come from somewhere. Um, those people who would say, well, deep sea mining, you know, I know what mining's like on land and I'm picturing that underwater. The starting place is that this is a very different process. There isn't any digging or blasting or drilling. So it's less invasive to start. There's no deforestation. There's no overburden to remove. And it's not in anybody's backyard. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we do have to study the impacts of collection. And we have um, worked with many of the leading research institutions around the world, including the UK Natural History Museum, MIT, the Scripps Ocean Institute. And we've spent over $150 million on our environmental and social impact assessment. So the starting place is, look, you have to do the work, you have to do the science, and now you're getting some of the results coming in, actually showing that getting metal from these polymetallic nodules reduces CO2 emissions per ton versus nickel or copper or cobalt uh, mined on land. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a lower impact source of these metals. And Craig, what's the political environment around deep sea mining, uh, specifically relates to, relates to geopolitical and related regulatory bodies, if you could kind of explain that landscape mm -hmm. to us. Yeah, definitely. Well, this industry would have gotten going in the 1970s had there been a regulatory environment in place. So the regulator for this industry is the International Seabed Authority. Mm -hmm. um, it was set up pursuant to the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea in 1994. That is 168 member states plus the European Union. So really, it's the sovereign nations of the world who first had a mandate to develop exploration regulations, which they delivered in 2001, and now to deliver exploitation regulations to allow this industry to move forward uh, while protecting the marine environment from serious harm. 
So really, we're at the tail end of a multi-decade process, and one of the first uh, times that an extractive industry, the very first time that an extractive industry has been regulated before it starts. Now, other countries are pushing ahead uh, with deep sea mining. China is very interested in the collection of polymetallic nodules, as is India. Um, Norway just announced that they are allowing exploration and pending environmental impact statements, exploitation of seafloor resources as well. So more people are seeing uh, that the resources on the seafloor uh, are going to be very valuable and critical for the clean transition. Um, so you should expect to see quite a bit more in terms of geopolitical headlines over 2024. And in fact, the United States um, has realized that they're a bit behind the curve in this industry. And while the US is not a member of the International Seabed Authority, we as a contractor could actually take this resource and bring it to the US for processing and take the US really from being totally dependent on imports for nickel, cobalt, and manganese to self-sufficiency in all three. Mm. And who, Greg, who are some of your competitors and, and why the metals company? Sure, well, right now, I think most of the other people who are looking to mine seafloor resources, we wouldn't even say competitors, we're all really collaborating, we're sharing information, because we all wanna make sure that the decision to mine the ocean floor and collect nodules from the ocean floor is based on the best available science. Um, so there's GSR out of Belgium, there's Loki Minerals out of Norway. Um, there are many you know, very good uh, companies that are great corporate citizens who are funding the scientific research that the world requires to make this informed decision. A lot of people would say, well, we have to you know, wait until we see that the science proves that um, you know, this can be done responsibly. And we think that based on some of the results that have been coming out in the last few years, uh, that question is being definitively answered. Uh, and we think that this can be monitored, it can be regulated, and it can be done in a way to minimize harm to the marine environment. Yeah. And how about the, how about the, the team, uh, the leadership team? Uh, what makes them special? What makes them unique? Um, and coming back to why, why the metals company? Sure. Well, the research <laughs> that's going on here has been um, led really by the metals company for the last 12 years. Uh, this team has been together for a long time conducting the research on the environmental impacts as well as um, you know, the resource definition work. So this team is very cohesive. It's a team that has gone through quite a bit of struggles over the last few years in the public markets, and yet the team has stuck together. And that's because we're all driving in the same direction to develop this very, very unique resource. At the end of the day, the resource is what makes this project very special. Uh, this is a resource that is extremely high grade. Um, this is the type of resource that if it was on land, it would have been developed hundreds of years ago. Um, so the management team is really um, mission focused on you know, getting uh, the science out there and available for the global community. And we've been very fortunate um, to have a cohesive team that's stuck together through thick and thin. Mm -hmm. And let's just talk about the future then. Where do you go from here? I mean, it sounds like you know, you've got the geopolitical issues, the environmental issues, and the business as well that you've all got to like juggle. So what's the roadmap? Well, the roadmap mm -hmm. is, first of all, the International Seabed Authority needs to finalize their exploitation regulations. Um, they will have another meeting in March and another one in July of 2024 to make further progress on those regulations. As the Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority has said, the final form of those regulations is really coming into focus. So we're really at you know, the two or one yard line in terms of finalizing these regulations. For the metals company, we have to finish our environmental impact statement, really the culmination of 12 years of work offshore. Uh, we have to finish our pre-feasibility work. We anticipate that being done in the middle of 2024 and then sometime after the July 2024 session of the ISA, launching our application, the first application to uh, harvest resources in international waters, um, which would allow us to begin production, assuming a one-year review process uh, by the end of 2025. So there's a lot that we have to do on our end to make sure that we're delivering the best possible application based on the best possible science. And while that's going on, the regulator is also uh, finishing what they need to do to deliver a very robust set of regulations. Okay, absolutely fascinating company. Thanks so much, Craig, for coming in and explaining that. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. My pleasure.